I want to at least cover four ways of interpreting. So there's four different ways you can interpret Revelation. Okay, so let's talk about these real quick. The preterist view. The word preterist literally means past. A full preterist believes everything after chapter 3 of Revelation, everything has already happened. All of it. Okay? They, they would believe that, in fact, the new heavens and new earth is symbolic. It's talked about in Revelation 20, that that came at the, when the kingdom of God came, when Jesus uh, came. That's a lot of came. But uh, anyways, they believe everything has happened in the past. Um, the problem with this view is that, uh, there's a, well, there's a lot of problems. But in its, portray, in its portrayal and revelation of the last battle, um, it says that all these surrounding nations um, surround the people of God. And it goes into kind of some detail about that. It's drawing on Daniel and Ezekiel. And these are pagan nations gathering against God's faithful um, of every race and nationality around the world. Um, and they would say, a full preterist would say, that that's describing what happens in AD 70 that we talked about last week, the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem. Without getting into all the details, that argument begins to fall apart at the seams, trying to apply what happens in Matthew 24 to the final battle in Revelation 20. It falls apart at the seams um, in different ways. But that, the, the preterist view is everything's happened. Everything. Now, I would be, as we discussed last week, a partial preterist that a lot of revelation has happened, but not all of it. And we talked about a few of these things. The, the judgment of God has not happened, the great judgment. And we talked about how judgment can sound scarier than it is, but it's actually a great desire for justice because God's a good judge. And sometimes we think that we're going to be more merciful and loving than God is in his judgment. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> he's more holy than you. He's more just than you. And he's more merciful than you. So he's going to do a better job of judging than you. <laughs> um, okay, let's go to the second view. The histor oh, Lord, historist. Am I saying that right, Joe? I'm just going to go with, if you say I'm doing it right, I'm going to feel confident. So, hey, guys. What was that? Yeah, that one. Um, so according to this view, Revelation is divided up into seven sections. Okay, this is the second view. Each of which is... Um, is about, is about the seven churches. Those are the different sections in the book of Revelation. And the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls all unfold one after the other in alignment with the seven ages. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how much we want to go into that one. Let's go on to number three. Okay. This is the futurist view. This is a very common view. This view takes pretty much the whole book of Revelation um, apart from chapters two and three. And uh, they refer to the very end of history. So we're not at the very end of history yet, because we don't know when the end is. But the futurist view is that everything out after Revelation 3 is yet to come. Everything. Um, with, without going into all the details, here's a few problems with, with this view, in my opinion. Um, Revelation, then, the, that book is no longer relevant to the, to, the, to the readers. It shouldn't have been, re in other words, it shouldn't have been written to seven churches. It should have been written to um, the, the future churches, is what John should have said, right? Because could you imagine, you know, you're going through an immense persecution, and John, John writes, in, from exile he writes, and it's written to you, and you're reading this, and you're like, this has nothing to do with us. <laughs> you know, like, this is not very comforting. So there's that. But um, it also takes Revelation very seriously, or very literally, I mean. And we talked about last week how the goal of Revelation, of understanding the Bible, is not to take everything literally but seriously. What did they mean by this? It's impossible to literally take every verse of Revelation literally. Right? You got horsemen. You have God depicted as a four-headed beast. You think he's coming out of the, the water? And we're, and we're worshiping him like that? You know, you think he actually has? You know, he has the four faces. It's also described in Daniel. And, of course, we wouldn't take... Um, here, here's a good one. Um, do you think the serpent in Genesis 3 is literally only a snake? No, of course not. We know that it's identified as the deceiver and the devil. And so we know that there's more happening there than just a snake slithering. You know what I'm saying? 
And so um, that might not be the best example, but that's one example. Okay, let's go to the fourth view. This is the view that we're going to talk about a little bit today, the idealist view. <laughs> Um, in my opinion, none of the three views we just covered um, provide satisfactory answers um, to being consistent in understanding Revelation. This view, I'm going to tell you right now where we're going with this. This view interprets Revelation symbolically in light of the Old Testament references and illusions from which it forms its substance. As we mentioned last week, the Old Testament is the grid, it is the code, the key to understanding Revelation. If we want to understand what the bowls are about and the plagues are about, we got to do a little bit of cross-referencing study. One of the problems with not using the Old Testament to understand the symbolism in, in New Testament and specifically Revelation is then um, we are all left to using the news to interpret what the Bible says. <laughs> and therefore, our interpretation of the Bible is constantly changing based on what happens in the Middle East. Right? Um, not only that, but then you have everybody who's interpreting the uh, world affairs differently, and it, it, just bec it just becomes very confusing and difficult and, um, and I, I think, inconsistent. So the idealist view uses the Old Testament as the grid for understanding what's happening in the New Testament, specifically in Revelation. Um, I'm going to give you, we're going to go through these. So let me just read off a few, a few things real quick, and then um, we're going to go through what's in here. And um, we're going we're gonna to move a little bit slower than we did last week. I think, I, I think we jumped around a little bit too much, and I want to move a little bit slower. Okay. Um, this view uh, accomplishes or views these, uh, these things. The church of every nation is portrayed through the book as the fulfillment of the nation of Israel. Okay. The plagues are symbolic representations of the literal plagues of Egypt. The book constitutes an exhortation to Christians to remain faithful to Christ in the midst of suffering that they experience as they refuse to compromise to the world's system. All the numbers in Revelation are symbolic, but receive clear, articulate meaning in its Old Testament background and reference. The millennium, which means, you know, thousand years. So there's, um, there's, all, there's, there's all these different views of of uh, the millennium, I would the the view I would be closest to is what's called a or a millennium, um, and we'll get into that. The millennium depicts the church during its time on earth between Christ's resurrection and his return. The picture here is the Exodus story from from the people of God going from Egypt to the Promised Land, and where do they find themselves in the middle, the wilderness. And that is what book of, the book of Revelation is describing what we're at. We're on our way to the promise of God, the promised land. God's still going to give us a land, right? Canaan was a foreshadow of the new heavens and the new earth. But we're in the wilderness right now. <sighs> okay. Last things, this view also holds that there's only one return of Christ. No secret rapture. Uh, if, we talked about this last week, but um, dispensationalism and rapture theology, um, at the heart of it, says that God made a promise to David and, and the people of Israel, and he has a covenant with them, and uh, they didn't really believe in the Messiah. They didn't believe in Jesus. So this is where Romans 11 comes in. He has to kind of cut them off for a second, and so then he introduces the church from every nation. And um, in every tribe, in every tongue. And, and the church is now his covenant people. So then he's, what he's going to do is the rapture is going to happen where God's going to come secretively. And he's going to rapture, take up all the Christians, just boom. You know, hopefully you're not like driving that day, you know, and someone's in the car. Sorry. Um, and just, you know. Um, and, and, and then that will happen. As, as they would say, described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, uh, and then God will come visibly and do his thing and deal with the covenant that he has with Israel. And then the tribulation starts and the judgments happen and yada, 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 yada. Well, um, I think it flies in the face 1,000% of the understanding 
of the people of God and the covenant he has with Abraham and David and all those people in the book of Romans. 